Hello, I'm Dr. James Shapiro, Director of the Clinical Islet Transplant Programme here at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. I'm providing you an update today on clinical islet transplantation and our very exciting strategies that we're trying to move forward ahead now in research to transform this treatment today for a cure close in our grasp for tomorrow. So islet transplantation and the cure for diabetes. Diabetes is a dangerous condition, there's no question. It's associated with high rates of kidney failure, strokes, heart disease, amputations, blindness, and we know today that the lifespan of a patient with diabetes type 1 is far less is than patients that don't have diabetes. Vision loss. It's, diabetes is the, is the commonest cause of vision loss in working age adults. It's the commonest cause of end-stage kidney failure, and it's the commonest cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputations in adults. The dead in bed syndrome is one of the most feared complications of diabetes, where patients die in bed from a hypoglycemic reaction. Islet transplant patients, Joan, talking about some of her fears before her transplant. Some of my fears have been greater than others, and one of my greatest fears was having a low in the middle of the night with not having the symptoms, not having the sweats. I actually went to bed at night afraid that I might not wake up and I really relied on my husband to be there for me and if he noticed me agitated or just not behaving the way I normally did. I never really had a good night's sleep after I lost the symptoms. I would find myself waking up many, many times in the night just afraid and I would get up and I would test and go back to bed and then wake up again, test, go back to bed. A very uncomfortable and a very scary feeling and along with that, I was afraid to drive. I, if I went in the car, I would test the minute I got behind the wheel, and I would stop every 20 minutes and test again just to make sure I was okay. So those were two fears that had a big impact on me also, and a big impact on my husband because he always worried about so These are very so real and meaningful fears for patients. As you can see here, this is a patient who has a continuous glucose monitor system in place. And this is a patient that actually died at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning from a severe hypoglycemic reaction uh, that occurred during the night, the dead in bed syndrome, documented by a continuous glucose meter, a very frightening uh, complication. So today we have to balance the risk between difficulties with type 1 diabetes and the need for lifetime anti-rejection drugs in an islet transplantation. But there's no question in my mind that today we have moved this treatment far safer than it's ever been before for patients. And I think we're very close now uh, to this balance between an islet transplant and immunosuppression because diabetes itself is a very, very dangerous condition to have. And the risks and benefits of an islet transplant and the wonderful control, sugar, sugar control that patients get after a transplant is so meaningful to the patient and really transforming in their quality of life that uh, these risks now, I think, can be exchanged pretty freely. Now, how much activity has occurred in the world in islet transplantation? Well, if we look back in 1999, there'd been just a handful of islet transplants done, but a, an appallingly low success rate, less than 10% of patients ever reached the point where they were off insulin. We transformed this with the Edmonton Protocol. We published this in 2000 in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and then we expanded our experience with 118 patients uh, treated in Edmonton, Miami, and Minnesota, where the one-year insulin independence rates were transformed from a mere 9% to 82% at one year, a really a transforming outcome. We went on to move this into an international multicenter trial, which I headed up through the Immune Tolerance Network and published this finding in uh, 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So if we look where we are today from when we started this program, well, we've now carried out uh, transplants in 156 patients, 320 islet, islet infusion procedures. We've got very good at this and very effective at the University of Alberta. And in fact, we've got uh, over 13 years of follow-up in some of these patients now, and we are still doing a really good job and getting better all the time. In fact, some of those very early patients, a few of them are still completely off insulin 13 years later. So if we look now across the spectrum of the last uh, 12 years or so in islet transplantation, we see this treatment has moved forward with our collaboration and working with partners across the world now. 800 patients have been treated in 30 different centers across the world, and we've had terrific uh, camaraderie and collaboration between these uh, centers. As I've mentioned to you, we've done the largest number of transplants anywhere else in the world at the present time. 
I thought I'd run through very briefly how we get our islets today. So the islets today come from a terrific team of uh, individuals. I'll show you a picture of them in a minute. These are the islets under the microscope stained red with a special dye. And that is an insulin needle that you see shining on the left hand side there. That is the uh, just give you some sense of scale for these cells that we put in, into the liver of patients. That's the team with uh, Tatsuyu and Doug and, and their uh, colleagues that make the islets. They work tirelessly day and night to, uh, and they're doing an absolutely brilliant job. They scarcely fail now. And in fact, I can tell you in the last month in January, we um, did nine transplants uh, in that one month, a record for us uh, because of this phenomenal team. So this is how we make the islets. <laughs> That's Dr. Tatsuya Kin, and he takes the uh, uh, pancreas, digests it, cleans it up, puts catheters into the uh, main portal vein. You can see him just cleaning up the pancreas uh, here that's been shipped from across the country. We receive uh, pancreas organs from right across Canada. And in fact, today we, we're not really short of pancreas organs because we're actually short of patients on our list. We're looking for uh, good patients. Our lists are very short. So this phenomenal team is now cannulating the uh, pancreas duct. And once they cannulate the pancreatic duct, they're going to inject some enzyme uh, through that system and I'm just going to advance the video a little bit to show you that now. So once the cannula is in place you can see the pancreas now being uh, distended and it sort of blows up a bit like a balloon and once it's blown up as, as a balloon then it's uh, chopped up in pieces and the, the collagenase enzyme starts to digest the pancreas and here's Doug shaking the chamber here, the recorded chamber and Tatsuya is looking under the microscope to see when the islets are freed and purified and when he sees that at a certain point the islets are being released well, he'll cool the system down, he'll dilute it, and at that point we can purify. And I'll just show you the purification system here. So the islets are put on this special system once we check they're alive, and then we mix them up with a, a sugar solution called Ficol. It goes on this machine called a COBE for about five minutes. And this separates the islets out from the rest of the pancreas tissue. And we go from 60 cc's of tissue, too much to put into a patient, to just a mere teaspoonful of uh, tissue to put in a patient. Quite a remarkable uh, process, takes about seven or eight hours. And then we keep the islets stored in uh, culture for a period of uh, one to two days while we get our patients ready. So that's the islet isolation. And then we simply put the islets in a bag. This is me doing the uh, patient one, 100 here. And the islets are then are fused in, into the portal vein. And this is a very simple transplant. It's a, we used to call it the drive-through transplant because it's really just literally a needle placed in the side with the patient under anesthetic uh, and local anesthetic they're awake. This is the catheter in the main portal vein and then once we know we're in the right place we drip the cells in just like a blood transfusion. The infusion itself takes about 10 minutes once the catheter is in place. You can see the cells dripping down that tube there. We check the portal pressure at the end and then once we're done we plug the tract to, to stop complications. We used to have the occasional bleed after this procedure but by doing this, by sealing the tract with uh, a solution of what we call avatine paste we can completely prevent that uh, complication and make this a very safe, in fact, the safest transplant uh, that exists for any patient at the present time, far safer than a heart, lung, liver, pancreas, or kidney transplant that's done because it really doesn't require any surgery at all. And the patient can, in fact, potentially go home the very same day after this procedure.